Hey there folks, this here's uh, your friendly, cuddly history teacher sending you on to the next segment of everything you need to know to pass your pesky little EOI US history exam. That would be end of instruction. And this one, there's a bunch of huge topics. I mean, this is monstrous. But I'm calling this first segment of the second set of standards Western Movement and Immigration. This covers roughly 1870 to 1900, so let's get on with it. Don't get scared and click off the video and think the entire thing is this. It's not. I'm just going to take a look at these first. So, number two, integrate specific textual and visual evidence to analyze the impact of Western Movement and Immigration on Migration settlement patterns in American society, economic growth, and Native Americans. Now these first sections, you know, most students don't ever really see these for themselves. It's always really big and just scary looking. You're like, what are these even talking about? They're always very, very vague. It's these little subsects that you have to really look at. And even these don't make a lot of sense. I mean, the people writing these things, ay, ay, ay. I've been doing this for a long time, and I have a hard time understanding what the heck some of this stuff means. Summarize the reasons for immigration. That's kind of what we're doing in this video. That's big. That's very broad. Shifts in settlement patterns. I don't even know what this really means or who they're referring to or what they're talking about. I'm pretty sure I know, but making sense of it is... It's hard to do, but I'm going to do my best to cover that in these series and to the best of my ability as far as what I think they mean. I mean, who are they talking about? And I'm pretty sure I know, but this is so vague that it's frightening to even think about. Uh, the Immigrant Experience, including the Chinese Exclusion Act, that's going to be a separate video. The impact of nativism, that's going to be in a later video. Americanization is a huge, broad topic. And even that, are they talking about the Native American Indians? Are they talking about the immigrants? Are they talking about both? And the immigrant experiences at Ellis Island. That's a massive topic. But enough for that now. Let's get on with the presentation. Okay, we got to start out with a justification that the settlers had for taking the Native American lands. And it basically falls down to a few things I'm going to point out right here. So first, white settlers, people of European descent, had a vastly different view than Native American tribes did about land and land ownership. To put it bluntly, Native Americans did not think you could own land Privately, the land belongs to everyone. Your the land's going to be here long after you're dead, and you can't pull it, put up a fence and coordinate off and say this is mine because it was here long before you were, and it's going to be here long after you were. Now you did have tribal territory and tribal lands, but the concept of private land ownership, they never could get the you know that just didn't fit their worldview. To the white man. Owning land was everything. Owning land made you respectable. Owning land made you worthy. There was wealth and value in it. And working the land was like something God intended for you to do. So these are two vastly different worldviews, and they're going to collide. And of course, you look at modern society today, you know how that collision uh, played itself out. Land ownership to the white man meant improving the land. If you weren't owning the land, you weren't doing anything with the land, you basically forfeited the land. You forfeited your right to the land. This was one of the flimsy little justifications they used because if there's a group of people living on a land and you're going to go in and force them off of it and fight them for it, you've got to have some kind of a justification. This was one of them. So even though there were people living on the plains... Uh, the white settlers viewed it as being unsettled. Now, how could you do that in your mind? Well, they didn't have roads. They didn't have uh, buildings. You know, they didn't have a flag, most importantly, waving over it, saying this was ours. This is our country. You know, they had tribes. They didn't have countries. Now, sometimes they would have confederations and things like that. But 
long as there wasn't some political flag, you know, waving over the thing, well, it's unsettled. And of course, race and religion are going to play a huge role in this. Yes, there are racist through lines in this that, you know, the feeling of superiority over the others. And religion. One said, well, they're not Christian. They kind of justify that in their mind. Doesn't seem like a Christian thing to do to go take away someone else's land. But you have to remember, if all this stuff hadn't played out, the United States of America wouldn't be here today. So yeah, the country's history's got its bad blights on it. And of course, this will be one of them. So, the reasons they came here. There's a bunch of them. A lot of the settlement of the West was driven by this desire to get rich. Strike it rich, baby. That's part of the American dream. That's part of the pioneering spirit. You're going to come here and you're going to work and labor and you're going to strive and you're going to get your fortune. You know, America represented a new beginning to so many people. People from all over the world, people from all walks of life are going to rush in here. And you see this with the 1849, you know, gold rush to California. And you're going to see lots of other gold rushes and silver rushes, people just flooding in. I mean, areas like South Dakota, there were almost no white settlers there at all. They discovered gold in the Black Hills. Same thing in 1858 in Colorado. Not hardly any white settlers there. They find gold. People are just going to flood in there by the tens of thousands. So you're going to have these boom towns just pop up almost overnight. And they attract people, like I say, from everywhere. I mean, these would have been interesting places to be. They would have been violent places to be. They would have been stinky places to be. I mean, these boom towns were filthy. They were disgusting. There wasn't any organized state government for sure. There wasn't any local government, you know, vigilante groups out there running around. People, you know, oh, they were dirty. You know, there weren't many places to bathe, and even if there were, people back then didn't really care a whole lot for bathing. They'd just throw up these little shack houses and huts. Uh, sidewalks would be made of wood, and there'd be sludge and human waste and everything else around. People weren't there to create a beautiful dream city, you know, a utopia. They were there to get rich. And, like I said, the violence, oh my gosh, the violence was out of control in these places. So... Who were these immigrants? Like I said, they were from everywhere. You had them coming from Ireland. You had them coming from the German Confederation States. You had them coming from Poland. You had them, you know, coming from China. Lots of African Americans saw this as an opportunity. Hey, let's get out of the South. Who wants to be a sharecropper? I want to go find some silver or some gold and strike it rich. So these people were coming from everywhere. Now, the really smart ones were the ones who went there and set up some kind of a business, even a laundromat. Uh, or, you know, go back to the 1849 gold rush. You know, Levi Strauss goes out there to make tents, and no one wants his tents, so he takes the denim and makes pants because the miners' pants are just getting ripped to shreds. You know, the people who went to sell food, shovels, mining equipment, those were the geniuses, and those were the ones that usually made the fortune. But, hey, this wasn't the type of place you went to pick up women, guys. This was not the place to go get the ladies. You don't even want to know the gender breakdowns of these types of communities. And the few women who were there, you know what they were doing to make money. It was, oh, I can't imagine how nasty these places had to have been. But Tombstone, Arizona is the famous one. Think of Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp. Uh, Virginia... City, Nevada, uh, Helena, or Helena, depending on where you're from, Montana. You know, these places start out as these little mining uh, communities. Some of them survive, some of them do not. Second reason people flooded west, the land. I mean, this is your fascinating statistic of this lesson. Get a load of this. In the first 250 years of American history... We settled, from Jamestown on, we settled roughly 400 million acres of land. 250 years. The second 400 million acres of land were settled in 30 years, roughly from 1870 to 1890. How did we do it so fast? Well, mainly it wasn't all heavily wooded. And two, railroads. Technology. The speed at which this happened is amazing. And once the Civil War was over, 
I mean, this boom was on. People were rushing in there at breakneck speeds. So mainly, it's this thing right here, railroads. The railroads, 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 I cannot emphasize that enough. How quickly it enabled you to get from one place to another. Because think of the Oregon Trail. It took four or five months to get from St. Louis, Missouri to Oregon Territory. Once they complete the Transcontinental Railroad, that took 21 years. They started before the Civil War. The Civil War slowed down everything as far as Western expansion. Lincoln tried to keep it going, as we'll get to here in a second, but uh, that Transcontinental Railroad, once they got it completed, you could get across the country in less than a week. I mean, it was got to where it could be like done in four or five days even. That's massive. And also made it where you could settle out there and still ship goods and things to market. Uh, so the first one took 21 years. After that, they built four more in just 15 years. So the whole country really gets connected together really fast. You could cover this territory in almost no time at all by their standards. The lure of this land, I mean, people flooded in there. But here's the little secret. The railroads gobbled up most of this land. Now, the deals they got for laying the land, laying the track on the land, was pretty impressive. I mean, for every mile of track you laid in a state, they got 10, eight, or 10 square miles of land. If it was in an unsettled territory, you got 20 square miles of land. So, the railroads gobbled most of this up, and then think about it. Where are most of the people going to be settling? Near the railroads. So that land was way more valuable. And later they're going to sell it. And not only that, they didn't always go the shortest distance between two places. I mean, they did this. Why? Because you had to lay more tracks so you got more land. I mean, this was a big money-making scheme that they had going on. And you can't say that you blame them since the government was just doling out this money. But the government wanted this land settled. The middle part of the country, they were just obsessed with getting it settled. So who built the railroads? Most of them were Civil War vets, or Irish immigrants, or Chinese immigrants, or African Americans, or Mexican Americans. These were the men who built the railroads. And a lot of these guys, of course, are going to settle land in and around the railroad, and that's going to help fill the center part of the country. So when the railroads got all this land, what do you do with it? Well, you turn around and settle it. And that's where people, like I said, want to live. The towns and cities and stuff are going to pop up near the railroads. And that's the valuable land. And people got disgusting rich off of this. They advertised the land that they were selling in European newspapers. And the Europeans, the poor class in Europe, who could not dream of owning land over there in Europe, you know, uh... Europe kind of evolved out of the feudal system. The people that owned the land owned the land. The peasant class couldn't own land there. So they just sold everything that they could, put what little possessions they had on the boat, and they came right on over. Amazing statistics here. In 1880, 44% of the people living in Nebraska were foreign-born. 70% of the people living in Minnesota and Wisconsin were foreign born. You know, these were immigrants who came over here to make a new life in America. I mean, this is the American dream. And that's how we fill up that section of the country. Uh, the Homestead Act, this was the basic platform for settling this land. During the Civil War, Lincoln wanted to keep the settlement of the central part of the country going. So they set up, you know, he signed this congressional law. 160 acres of free land per household. Now, you had to be the head of the household, and if you were, you could qualify for 160 acres of free land. You didn't even have to be a citizen. If you were an intended citizen, you could get this land. So this was how they kept people settling in Kansas and Nebraska and the Dakotas. And poor people, again, were flocking from Europe to get in here and claim this land. About 600,000 families settled a plot of land from 1862 to 1900. That's a lot of people, 600,000 families. I mean, that sounds like an awful lot, but believe it or not, most of the land was taken by the railroads. So, in Kansas, you had African Americans leaving, you know, the southern states, 
going to Kansas to become farmers, they were called exodusters. And of course, the last great act of theatrics, even after most of that land was claimed that you know, was valuable, that people wanted, uh, Congress kept pushing for more and more and more. So we ended in grand uh, in a grand way here, 1889, the Oklahoma land rush. Two million acres of land were settled in one day. That's a crazy number. And of course, we got a picture of that great moment in history. And it's a cool picture. I like that picture. So, 90% of it was taken by ranchers or the railroads or lumber companies. Only about 10% of this land was settled by families. So the cattlemen, they didn't always honor people's land claims. You know, they uh, just grazed their cattle openly. Uh, the mining companies didn't much particularly care, nor did the lumberjack. Woodcutters, I saw that word, and I was just like, woodcutters? Had to use it, but yeah, the lumber companies, they were the ones who took most of this area. You know, and eventually barbed wire's gonna cordon the thing off, and the buffalo are gonna be wiped out, and Yellowstone National Park and other parks are gonna be created, because, you know, there were a few places out there whenever people saw them and they wrote about how majestic and beautiful these places were. They said, we can't let this place be destroyed. We can't let the lumber companies come in here and cut it down. You know, the mining companies rip these places apart. So we start setting aside sections of, you know, the most majestic territory. Thankfully, they did it as Yellowstone and Yosemite. And in 1890, the Census Bureau came out and said the frontier no longer exists. We literally consumed the entire thing, settled it, tamed it, in literally like 20 to 30 years. I mean, it is amazing how fast this actually happened. So the frontier no longer existed. Uh, the bison were nearly destroyed, but I'm going to have to talk about that in a future video. That'll be kind of a sad one. Uh, the Native Americans no longer roamed free. They were on reservations. They set up schools and stuff to assimilate the Native American children. And this entire play was over in a tragically short period of time. But I do want to end this by saying just the role that the American frontier played in creating what this country is. I mean, this era of American history kind of symbolizes our character and the spirit of America. I mean, this is American and it's dream personified. Just this lure of going out there, getting away from Europe or getting away from the eastern crowded cities and going out and living a simple and primitive frontier life. I mean, this, we romanticized this era of history and yeah, I said these people, they stunk really bad and it was always dangerous and life out there wasn't pleasant or glamorous. But, you know, there's just something about it, this lure of going out there, this new unknown, this starting a new life, you know, this rebirth that you could have. This is what America symbolized to those European immigrants, those, you know, poor peasant class. The people in the East who were just, you know, fed up with the bad breaks or whatever that they got. You could go out West and used to you had to get on, a, you know, a wagon trail or something. It'd take you four or five months. Now you can get on the railroad and just go right on out there, get you a plot of land. Now, not all this land was created equal. I mean, it was a lot easier to do this in Minnesota or someplace than it was in Arizona. You know, uh, the further west, out in the desert, you got the rougher it was going to be, and 160 acres of land may not be enough, but just the opportunity. I mean, that's why they went to the gold mines and the silver mines. I mean, this was the American dream. This is what made America unique. You know, Europe wasn't like this. There wasn't this big, vast, untamed, just massive swath of hundreds of millions of acres of land just up for the grab. So this is the pioneer spirit. This is the Old West cowboy, you know, the cattle trail guys. This is the untamed plains warrior spirit. And this is America, and this is American history. So I didn't mean to go off on a big tangent there, but it was something I just wanted to throw in. I mean, this is a golden age of American history. And there's a lot of tragedy in this era as well. But this kind of pointed out the reasons for the land, 
grab, you know, how it happened and why the immigrants were coming here. So if you found this video useful, please like below, subscribe, share, comment, do all those great things, and I'll be back with future installments, Chinese Exclusion Act, stuff like that's coming up in future videos. So until next time, I'm Robert with Reading Through History, and this is everything you need to know.